Hi all. Uh, today, I think what I'm going to show you is a, for beginners, uh, a process of taking miniatures from a box and getting them all the way to table ready. So I'm going to walk you through assembly, spray priming, and then painting a miniature in one video. Here we go. We're going to start with uh, the spirit hosts from the start collecting malignants box uh, these are actually one of the most tricky miniatures in games workshops range to assemble but I need them for an upcoming tournament in two weeks so we're gonna do them the first thing I want you to note is the back of the box uh, the back of the box often comes with painting color schemes they are obviously going to be citadel paints um, but this is for instance the how they recommend you paint this dark blue robes. Uh, this is how they recommend you paint the bone on like the skeletons here. Uh, and this is how we're going to paint the spirit hosts themselves. We're going to start with a gray. I'm going to just spray that right on as primer. Then we're going to wash the whole model with green wash. And then we're going to dry brush it with Ulthuan gray. And that'll be that. So here we go, here are the three, these look like what, 50 millimeter bases for the spirit hosts that came in the box. Here are the three sprues, and here are the instructions. The things you'll need to assemble Citadel miniatures. You're going to need some sort of glue. Uh, for plastic, which this entire miniature is going to be polystyrene plastic, the Citadel does make a range of plastic glue. Don't get this. They give you about a quarter of the bottle and it just, it's, it's not good. It's not a good value. What I recommend is this here, the Testers Model Master liquid cement for plastic models. Uh, this comes with uh, one fluid ounce or 30 milliliters, uh, which is about 15 times as much as you're going to get in the Citadel thing. And what I like about this particular one, the Model Master, is that the applicator is just a long metal thing. It's really easy to use for spotting and, and getting into small places. And if the glue ever gets dried up inside of it, you can just heat up the metal bit with a lighter and it just comes out right fine. You don't have to worry about melting plastic. This is anywhere from 10 to $15 on Amazon or your local hobby store. Also, if you're going to get super glue, this is the super glue you want. I've tried Loctite, I've tried Gorilla Glue. They're both decent, but this stuff holds the best. The JB Super Weld Professional Grade Super Glue. Uh, I picked this up at Walmart. I'm sure you can find it elsewhere. You're also going to need a set of clippers. Now, the thing to look for is these clippers actually have a flat side and they have an angled side. Most, uh, what are they called? Lineman tools, something like that. Uh, lineman dikes, if you want. Angle cutters. Most of them have angles on both sides. What you want is one that is completely flat on one side. This allows you to get right up against the miniature and clip it out without leaving too much of a nub there that you're going to have to file down later. These can, Citadel has a pair of these. Uh, if you get the Citadel start painting kit, something like that, it comes with a set of these, it comes with a brush, and it comes with about uh, 10 Citadel paints. That's the best value you're going to find. These by themselves from Citadel are about $30, not a good value. If you want just the clippers, you can go to Michael's or Hobby Lobby or something and look in the jewelry section and you'll find something like this, which is about $10 and it will do you almost as good as the Citadel ones. I've used this for a long time. The next thing you're going to want is an X-Acto knife. Um, this is the most common kind that you're going to find. This is going to help you remove the flash and the mold lines from the plastic that you're going to clip out. So here we go, Spirit Host 1. This is all very confusing. But what you'll see is, you know, for instance, we're going to start with piece 7 and piece 8. 
So what we'll do is we'll go and find on our sprues, they are labeled with numbers. I'm not sure, there you can see them in this light here. So we need seven and eight and here's number seven. So the reason we want, again, flat side clippers is we're going to put the flat side up onto the bit we're going to use and we're just going to snip those off like so. Then we're going to turn it around again using the flat side close to the bit we're going to use. Snip them out. Snip them out. And then piece eight is right here. Um, a lot of tiny bits. Make sure you get a good grip on it so it doesn't go flying. Snip it out as close as you can to the miniature using the flat side. The next step is taking your X-Acto knife and everywhere that we just clipped out, there's going to be a little bit of a nub. You can usually see it right there. So here you can see that there's two nubs and you're going to take your X-Acto knife and just make sure that they're flush with the rest of the miniature. The other thing that you're going to look for is mold lines. Uh, here's another nub. It's right on the arm, so this one's raised. That's why I use the X-Acto knife. Uh, you can also use a little file, but honestly, the X-Acto knife is the best tool because it does other things as well. We're just going to cut that off. And then if you scrape it the other way, you can get rid of that nub completely. I'm going to do this other piece. It's going to be really hard because big fingers, tiny piece. I actually don't see enough of a nub to worry about. So this is piece number 30 here and I'm cutting this out because I want to show you mold lines. So here is the nub. I'm just going to get rid of that. You can go forward with the knife using the sharp edge to cut the nub, the nub and then you can use the back edge scraping the other way to make it nice and pretty as a ghetto file. Now the reason I'm showing you this piece is because I see a mold line on this side. A mold line is a sharp edge that's raised where the two sides of the mold came together. And to get rid of those, you can just scrape along the edge of it going backwards. And the mold line's gone and it's nice and flush. Some model kits are better than others with this. Sometimes you have mold lines everywhere and it takes you three hours to get them all done. The reason you want to get them done is because when you put paint on it, it just exaggerates the mold line and it looks terrible. So spends the minutes on each piece, make sure the nubs are completely flush they, and all the mold lines are gone. Again, the mold lines can be done just by one scrape over like that. You can even use the back of the X-Acto knife so that you're not worrying about cutting anything. The Citadel has a mold line remover tool. This is another $20 tool that's completely unnecessary because all it is is just the back of an X-Acto knife. So I will begin assembling these models and then we'll get back to you. So when it comes to assembling your miniatures, um, you look at your instructions to figure out what you're going to do. Then you pre-position your miniatures just to make sure they fit. There's no extra flash that you need to remove. Uh, and then once you're finished with the fit, again, the spirit hosts are one of the most tricky things to do. Um, you're going to take a little bit of your plastic cement and just put a dollop on there. The reason you want plastic cement rather than super glue, which is also useful, is because plastic cement actually melts the plastic on either side of the join and that creates a more secure bond. Um, if you use just super glue and you drop your miniature, and you will drop your miniature, um, it will shatter and go all over the place. If you use plastic cement and you drop your miniature, the chances of that are much less because it is actually a much stronger bond. So we put a dollop of cement on there 
we're going to position the miniature the way we want it. Spirit hosts are tricky. And then you have a few seconds to reposition it, but then you just kind of want to hold it in place for about 10 to 15 seconds. And then it is secure enough to move about and work with. Okay, so that's been about 15 seconds. Um, it is still wobbly. Uh, so we're going to gently place it down, let it dry a little bit, and then we'll continue on with our miniature. What you may consider doing is letting one piece dry while you clip out and cut the flash on the next pieces that you're going to need. Much like a Lego set, you only clip out the pieces that you're going to need in the next step. Do not get tempted to cut everything off the sprue and get all the mold lines off at once. You might think that that's an efficient way to go about it, sort of like an assembly line process, but you are going to lose which piece is which, and some of these get so confusing that you're not going to figure out what is what. You're making, your more, you're making more work for yourself. Um, while the previous assembly is drying is the perfect time to cut out the pieces and get the mold lines off of the next pieces that you're going to need, and only the next pieces that you're going to need. The other thing to do is if you're building, say, a squad, like this is going to be a squad of three, while one is drying, you can start assembly on the, the next one. For, so for instance, infantry troops, sometimes all the legs come separate from all the torsos. What you can do is cut out all the torsos, cut out all the legs, glue those together, and then by the time the last one is done, the first one will be ready for the arms. Something like that. Now I generally recommend you be as gentle as you can with this plastic while still getting what you need to be able to do done. Uh, if you happen to snap a piece, uh, and you will because they do get a little bit fendly, there are a couple things you can do. Um, if it's small and fendly like this, you can just decide to leave it see what happens. Um, you can pretend it's battle damage. Uh, if it's a little bigger than this, you can use some plastic glue and try and glue it back on. Um, if you're willing to spend some money, you can go to eBay and see if they'll sell. Uh, there are bits on eBay, like I'm sure you can go on eBay and find just these heads, for instance. Uh, expect to spend five to fifteen dollars on trying to find just that bit that you broke. Uh, or you can, of course, go and rebuy the whole kit. So just be careful, but there are options when you do break it. Uh, there is such a thing as pinning a model to make things more secure, but that's a whole other video. Uh, when you're gluing the models together, uh, I recommend using as little glue as you think you can get away with. Uh, if you put too much glue on there and flood it, or you get the glue somewhere where you don't want it to be, Feel free to just take a napkin and dot it back off uh, and get just the amount that you want. Uh, also, if you happen to position something wrong, you have generally about an hour for before which it, it really starts to melt together and you can still pry these bits apart. Um, after that, it becomes much more difficult. If you set it for a day, it's not coming apart. Uh, because they're at that point melted together, you're going to have to use a knife and get in there and possibly damage things. Uh, but feel free to reposition as many times as you need. If you happen to pull it apart, you'll notice that it's partially melted, it's a little bit stringy, it looks dry. Just apply a little bit more plastic glue and you can start the whole process all over again. A note about value. Uh, if you need models and they happen to come in a start collecting box, buy the start collecting box. For instance, in this box, I really only need these three models, but the start collecting box represents at least a 40% value over retail. So for instance, if I only need these, this big cut thing here is a $60 model. These things here are, I don't know, 30, $25, something like that. 
I can just resell them to somebody else who does need these and essentially gain more money than I spent on the bits themselves. So these start collecting boxes, if you can use them in preference to any one of these individual kits, do so. Now when the miniature itself is done, uh, a word of note on gluing them to the base. The I'm not sure if it's the material that they use or if it's because there's actually a texture on here, but the plastic glue onto the base is not as good as the polystyrene to polystyrene. So you're going to actually have to hold the glue in place for a good minute before it really gets secure. So again, it's it's not going to be the 15%, the 15 seconds that gluing a model to itself is going to be. When you're gluing a model to the base, you need to hold it for a good 30 seconds to a minute. So here we have one completed spirit host. Uh, it is glued to the base with the decorative grave site provided on there. Now this is a complete model that is actually ready to be played with on the table. Um, this is gray plastic. It is not preferred. It is preferred that when you use, uh, when you play a gauge of Age of Sigmar or Warhammer 40,000, you actually put time in to paint them. But again, this is completely usable as is as a spirit host. Now, the next step for this model is we're going to be putting a little bit of texture on the base uh, to make it prettier. And then we will begin the painting process. So now I have three spirit hosts built. Uh, all the plastic is on the base. So the next step is to add a little bit of flavor to these gigantic 50 millimeter round bases. And the easiest way to do that I've found is this stuff from Hobby Lobby, Liquitex Basics Coarse Texture Gel. Basically you squirt this out on the base and it creates a kind of like a sandy dirt mud kind of thing however you want to paint it citadel miniatures or games workshop makes their own texture paints uh, they have a whole line of them like the sterling battlemire that will do uh, quite some fancy things actually this one creates kind of like mud puddles they have one that creates like that cracked desert feel they have one that's supposed to be just a snow texture, uh, but these bottles are $7 each, and they really only come about a third of the way full, so it's not that great of a value. If you just want something quick and easy, this stuff here will last you quite a long time. Another thing you're going to want is a cheap palette. This one was probably $0.98 cents at either Walmart or Michaels. Uh, it does exactly what you need it to do. Basically, I'm going to squirt some of this stuff on the palette and the one of the Citadel tools I do recommend is their uh, texture paint applicator tool there's really nothing other like it it's designed specifically for texture paint it's got a scoop on one end and a smaller scoop on another end and it's really perfect for doing what we need to do we're just going to take a scoop of it and we're going to blop it down and create some dirt piles in this case to build up an effect of the skeleton digging itself out from the grave. So I'm just going to push this stuff around until I am happy with the results. And you can play around with it as much as you want. What I'm trying to do is avoid it looking like there's brush strokes or tool strokes here so just kind of randomizing the mess and you can just clean up extra with a towel or your fingers as you will and you can put as much of this on there or as little on there as you want And then that's ready for paint. So here we have three spirit hosts with the texture applied to their base. They're all assembled. 
Now they are ready for priming. With plastic miniatures, you want to apply a priming coat of paint before you apply any acrylic paint, just so it sticks to the plastic and any other surface it has to be on with minimal fuss. The recommended way is cheap spray paint that you get at Walmart. Um, you want to make sure that you get a matte or flat coat uh, and I like the Krylon a lot better than I like the Rust-Oleum 2X but the Rust-Oleum sometimes in the colors you want it's the only one available. Uh, you'll notice here I have a satin finish I don't like that I prefer a matte finish because the satin gloss will impact what I want to do later but what you'll notice is that I have a gray and a white. What I'd like you to get in the habit of is find, figuring out which color is going to be covering the most of the model and get that color spray paint as your primer. And then you're going to get a lighter version of the same color or even white to spray on the top of it to show where highlights are going to be. It's a good habit to get into. It's called zenithal priming. You can look up more videos on that on YouTube. The other thing that I suggest is getting obviously something like a tarp or a cloth and then some paint sticks. From Home Depot you can just grab a package of paint stirring rods. I glued two of them together with super glue and then I used the 3M double sided tape so that on one side I can just stick the miniatures there one two three obviously that you can tell that this has been used before it's the great thing about it it's double sided so that this way you can get to all the angles of your miniatures without dirtying your fingers or doing multiple trips or anything like that so a word about spray paint. Uh, there are environmental conditions that you need to be prepared for. You really do not want to spray in anything above a 50 or 55 percent relative humidity. Um, you don't want to spray when it's too cold. So if you can do it indoors, great. Um, you can get an airbrush if you're always spraying. Um, and once you get into this hobby, you'll always be spraying. But once you assume that you have a relatively warm and relatively dry atmosphere, we can just start spraying. And, well, I shouldn't have to teach you how to use a rattle can. But we're going to cover the miniatures, maybe two coats. And the great thing about the stick is you can get all the angles. And the base coat, we're just looking to cover the entire miniatures. Again, you want to use the color that the miniature is going to be most of, just to save you time. Okay, so coat number one is done. You can see that maybe it's not covering the white of the texture base quite as much as I'd like. So I'm going to give it a second coat. Same process as before. Okay, so I've got two coats on the spirit hosts of the gray. Um, and then what I'm going to do now is spray white as a zenithal prime. What zenithal as a word means from the top. So what I'm going to do is just from straight down, I'm going to lay down some white. And what this is doing is providing a built-in highlight so that even if we do nothing else, the miniature already has some contrast on it and looks interesting. So what we can see here is that from the top, they're white, from the bottom, they're gray, and if you look at it straight on, they got a nice little contrast uh, for miniatures like infantry and heroes and whatnot. This will give you a good idea of where the shadows are going to be, where the highlights you want to be 
Uh, you can even just glaze paint, which means a really thin coat of paint over the top of this, and you don't have to do much highlighting. But these are ghosts. I'm not going to use too much of a highlight anyway, but this is a habit that I want you to get started on, even when you're just starting. Even if you end up covering over all of this with paint, um, I still recommend you start with a quick zenithal prime. And with that, these are primed and ready for paint. We'll see you back at the work table. Okay, so here we have three primed and ready spirit hosts, and we are going to apply the first layer of paint. There are, uh, I would consider, four steps to the actual painting process. We're not going to count the priming process, uh, but the priming process does give you a head start on the first process. So it's going to be a base coat, a wash, a layer, and a highlight. And what we did with the spirit host was they primed them the gray slash white combo that's going to be the base of the ghosts themselves. So all I really have to do for this model is put a base coat on the things that isn't ghost. So I'm going to use some Rhinox hide or a dark brown for the base itself and the dirt. I'm going to use Xandri dust or a dark khaki for the skeleton and the skull, things like that. I'm going to use a dark gray uh, for the gravestones. And then I'm going to use, on this particular model, the gravestones have candles on it, so I'm going to use Rackarth Flesh, which is kind of a, a pale, very, very desaturated pink. Um, and that's going to be for the candles. So we'll start with the... Let's get the bottom done first. So we'll start with the base. Give your paints a good shake. Oh, I forgot. And for the weapons, we're going to use... Vallejo Metal Color Steel. This is a dark silver tone. The Vallejo Metal Color Airbrush Colors is, according to Vince Venturella, a fellow YouTuber, the best metal paint that you're going to get for miniatures. It just works super well and it looks awesome. So with the Rhinox hide, I need a large area covered. So I'm going to use a large brush, and we're just going to use this one here, I think. We'll use this brush here. I believe this is probably like a six or something, but it's so old that you can't even tell. Um, this brush is probably 20 years old, but the, the tip still works for things like large areas and washes, so I keep it around. Uh, so what we're going to do is... I'm going to wet the brush a little bit and bring some water into the lip of the pot there. Control what I keep on the brush and then just kind of smear it on. The thinner you make the paint, i.e. the more water you add, the easier it is to spread over surfaces, but the more layers you'll require to put on. So this is going to be a pretty thin layer because I just want to get it on there. Uh, and I might have to go over this twice. I'll be doing this for all three of these spirit hosts just the same way. Now a couple of things of note. Uh, I prefer to do assembly line painting which means that I take one step and do it to all of the models at the same time, one after the other. And then I move on to the next step and do that to all the models. This is the most efficient way to paint because if you do one model at a time, you're going to sit there and you're going to need to open a paint bottle, close a paint bottle, wash out your brush, this, that, and the other thing, and it takes away from the, your efficiency. So I always recommend doing one step at a time across multiple models. Now, I want to caution you, there is the other extreme to that. Uh, what I don't recommend is doing one step on 50 models. So if you have a horde of 40 skeletons, don't try to do all of them at once 
you're going to go insane and you're going to experience burnout very, very fast. The best compromise is to do five models at a time. That way in a unit of 10, you do the same process twice. In a unit of 40, you're gonna do the same process eight times. But if you do five models at a time, you can see you progress on the model and it's a more rewarding experience rather than having to wait for the reward across 50 models. The other thing to talk about is painting in sub-assemblies. So what you'll see here in this video, I've assembled the model completely and put it on his base and then started painting. There are times that you want to keep the model in half assembled pieces to make hard to reach areas easier to paint. So for like, for instance, it could be okay to keep the ghost here separate from the base, paint the base all together paint the ghosts together, and then when they're done, glue them together. Uh, the, the reason I don't do this is because I have so many unpainted miniatures and I change what I want to play so many times that I'd rather just get the miniature assembled. That way I can put it on the table, even as gray plastic, and start playing with it immediately. That's just the way I go. There are people who insist on only fielding fully painted models and those people will do sub-assemblies because it does offer shortcuts. Well, not it doesn't offer shortcuts. Some people do sub-assemblies because it allows them a more complete paint job. So as you can see, I'm just moving. I'm taking my dark brown, tying it on all the bases, all three miniatures, same step, one after the other. I'm also, I'm not trying to be neat here at all. The, what I'm working with is Games Workshop base paints. Uh, these are formulated to go over just about any primed surface. Um, they're very, th they're, they are thicker than their layer paints, and so they coat easier. What that means is that if you're silly and you prime a model black, and you want it yellow, Games Workshop makes this handy thing called Averlin Sunset. It's a base coat. It'll take about two, maybe three layers of this to get the model sufficiently yellow. Whereas if you were to use normal paint or Games Workshop layer paint, uh, this you'd probably sit here for eight layers before it got sufficiently yellow over black. So two things. Uh, if you're base coating, try to use base color paints. Um, and if you are painting something in bright colors, don't prime it black. Base colors are all just going to overlap it well enough that I don't have to worry about staying within the lines. This is just the first coat. I just want to get the color on there and then we can tidy it up in later steps. The other great thing about working in assembly lines is that these are acrylic paints that we're using, which means they're water-based, so they dry very fast. So by the time you're done putting the color on the last model in the series, the first model in the series is probably going to be dry. So this was one coat of the brown. I'm just going to go back in and touch it up with another coat, hitting all the areas that either I missed or the paint doesn't cover sufficiently for my liking. While my base coat is drying on the base, I did lay it in a little thick. Uh, I want to go over brushes. Uh, first, the anatomy of a brush. The important bit that you need to know is this metal part is the ferrule, and obviously this is the, the hair, the brush itself. When you put paint on a brush, try not to get the paint above about the halfway mark. If you get paint underneath the ferrule in there, the brush is ruined. Uh, it's very easy to do, especially with short, uh, fine detail brushes. You just have to be very careful when you're mixing, picking up paint, that kind of a thing, not to get 
paint too far up the brush. Even if you get paint up halfway, that what happens, because this is acrylic paint and it dries so quickly, the paint will actually dry on the paintbrush and ruin the bristles. Now, a lot of that's easy enough to fix. Um, there's brush soap that you can use, but the, the, the best way to care for brush is, as I said, not to get paint too far up the tip. And halfway through a painting session or halfway through a color, after maybe five minutes or so, just give your quick brush a, a quick rinse. Clean the brush off and dip into the color again. Even if it's the same color, just make sure that paint doesn't dry in these hairs. That will damage the brush. I want to show you some brushes that didn't hold up well. Um, this is a Citadel small dry brush. This is expensive because it's a Citadel, but honestly their dry brushes are the best dry brushes because they do exactly what they need to do. We'll get into dry brushing later, but you'll see at the very tip there, if I can get that in, you can see at the very top the brush, the bristles are spreading out. Um, this is not a healthy brush anymore, but dry brushing in essence is taking dry paint and working against texture on a model. Dry brushing is the quickest way to ruin a brush, so for dry brushing Use the Citadel dry brushes specifically with the keep in mind that they're not going to last very long, so it is an expensive investment. Um, but don't use your good brush for, for dry brushing. Uh, base coating is the second worst thing for your brushes. I don't know if you saw before, but I was really just kind of stabbing rather than brushing the paint on because there's lots of times where you need to get the paint in that recesses. Um, I find for base coating, about $5 a brush is where you want to be. You can see here previous base brushes that did not last. So the one on the right, I don't know if you can see, but that tip is bent. This is a synthetic brush, and that happens very quickly. The tip gets bent in, and it's no longer useful. These other two brushes, you can see that's... If I apply some effort, I can, but they are not holding a tip. This also happens with cheap brushes and when you get paint up in there. So these essentially are lost brushes. They're not going to be used anymore. I went to Michael's for an experiment and I bought basically one of every kind of brush they have. All the brushes at Michael's are synthetic, even their top of the line ones. But for base coating, um, what I'm looking for is a brush that's not going to get its tip bent and essentially that the paint flows from well. I think what I said settled on is Michael's number two quality, their artist quality for, I believe this is for watercolors, not acrylics. Um, it's the Artist Loft from Vienna. These are about three to five dollars per brush but I can pretty be pretty sure oh, is this one starting to this one's actually starting to bend already I've only had this for about a week um, but what you want is a number two probably a number four and then a one and a zero round those are really all the brushes that you're going to need for base coat I would argue that you probably don't even need a one or a zero for base coating that's more for layering and you want better brushes for that anyway. But in order of brush destruction, dry brushing is the worst for brush, base coating is the second worst for brush. You still want a good brush because you want it to last more than a week, but you don't want to spend $15 on a brush that's only going to last a month. So my compromise is 3 to $5 for a brush. So I have a couple brushes that I want to show off again. This is my 20 year old brush. I'm pretty sure that this is natural hair. Um, I could be wrong though, but I'm, I still have this brush. It was an old tester's brush, red handle. That's all I can tell because the label is worn off. I think it's like Royal Sable, something like that. I don't even know if they make them anymore, 
but I use these brushes all the time for base coating and washing. Next we have our base brushes, like I said, this number two from Artist's Loft. I've also had okay success with these uh, Master's Touch. I believe these are synthetics from Hobby Lobby or Walmart. Uh, this, is the, this is what the package looks like. Uh, I'm actually pretty sure from looking at this, this is from Hobby Lobby. Uh, but it comes with like six to eight brushes. Uh, you'll use only about half of them, but the whole package is seven bucks. So that, that's pretty good value for brushes that aren't going to last very long. Then I also have the super good brushes. So the Windsor Newton Series 7 acrylic is generally considered to be one of the best brushes you can get for miniature painting. It is a natural sable hair. It's actually called uh, Kalinsky sable. It's Russian. It's fur from some sort of critter. Um, and these are about 12 to $15 per brush. I would recommend, if you can find it on Amazon, they have a set, like a collector's or gift set, that's a two, a one, and a zero. Perfect, grab it. And we're gonna use these for the fine details. So on step three and above, where we're starting to get the smaller stuff in. So the base coat on the bases is dry enough where I'm going to, actually we'll go, we'll mix it up. We'll do some uh, metal work. So this is the steel from Vallejo Metal Colors. And this is a dropper bottle, so we're gonna need a pallet. And there isn't much steel on this, and this actually spreads really well. So all we need is a drop, and that'll be enough for what we're doing. So I'm gonna take my artist's loft brush. We'll shape the tip a little bit. And we're going to just dip it right in and paint it on. And this goes on very smooth with a good brush. It's very easy to control where it's going. Now there are several schools of thought on how, how to hold your miniature while you're painting. They make special handles for it that basically grab onto the base and you can hold the handle and not touch the miniature while you're painting it. I'm a little that seems like too many steps for me. I usually do just fine. Uh, if I need to, I'll hold the base like this. But one of the keys for stability on getting the fine motor control for this base is to, the, 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 the hand that you're using to brush with, use your pinky and put it right on the miniature and that stabilizes the hand so it reduces the shaking. And just apply. Now this is going on super easy because of the paint formula and the quality of the brush. Yes, I have had years of practice with this, and if you are, you know, shaky hands, it might not come as easy. But with practice, and if you need some helpers, grab the helpers, but anybody can do this. So that's the silver bits on this model. And like I said, we're gonna assembly line it. We'll just go right to the next model. And I'm being, I'm making uh, an effort here to be neat. I don't really want to go over what I want to be white with such a dark color. I'm not terribly worried about it. I can clean it up later, but here I am making an effort to be a little neat. Now when you dip the brush in the palette, reminder not to get the paint too far up the bristles and you want to control how much paint is coming off the brush. So if you need to, you can drag it along a bare spot, make sure you get a nice point on it. Uh, if you have just got a glob of paint, feel free to wipe it off on a paper towel you want the paint to come off without effort and without leaving like dry streaky bits on it. You'll 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 get you'll start to get a feel when you have too little paint. You'll also know quite readily 
when you have too much paint. So this is getting tricky in here. I've already slipped up a couple times and put some silver where I don't want it to be. But again, I'm not going to worry too much about that yet. We can go back and clean that up later. With painting with a brush, this is not a pencil, it is not a crayon, it is not a marker. You're not drawing with the tip. What you're doing is getting paint a little bit up the bristles, maybe about a third of the way up the bristles, and you're painting with all of the paint on there. Use as much surface area of the brush that you can for two reasons. One, it's faster because it covers more area, and two, it gets some of that paint off of the bristles because again you do not want paint drying in the bristles this is acrylic paint it dries very fast so as a reminder every so often clean that paint off let it wick on a paper towel so we don't get too much water and thin the paint down more than we want grab some more continue painting Gentle pressure is all you need. The harder you push on the paintbrush, the more damage it does to the brush, especially for synthetics. All right. That's all the silver done. We didn't even use all of that one drop that we put on there. So we clean the brush, we go to the next color. I think what I'll do next is the gray because the that's the next furthest or that's the next layer up. So we're going to be doing the, the Zandri dust on top of the gray, so let's do the gray first. So actually I'm going to grab a bigger brush because this is going to be a larger surface area. And We will try out Windsor and Newton Cotman. This, I believe, is the level one at Michael's for watercolor or acrylics. But this is going to be a four round because I want more surface area covered. So these are base coat paints again. They are thicker. So we're going to wet the brush a little bit and get some paint on there. Kind of mix the two so it flows nice and well. And we're just going to draw it on there. When you grab a new brush, you most likely have to wet the brush completely and mold the tip just so that it's nice and compliant. It has some bend and some give to it. What you'll see with the even the larger brushes, like this number four brush, I can still get quite a small line on there because it's a point and it's I've thinned the paint down correctly. But because it's a large brush, I can also get quite a large area by just applying slightly more pressure. And here again, I'm being neat without too much effort to be neat. Just because this is no longer the first color on there, and I'm trying not to overwrite the first color that I put on there. But again, don't be alarmed if you did, because this is the base coat step. You can always just come back with brown, go over it again, come back with gray, go over it again, etc etc until you are pleased with it or not it's your miniature you are free to be however neat or unneat you want to be and yes this is a Windsor & Newton brush it's the same company that makes my $15 series 7 Klinsky Sable but this is a synthetic brush uh, it is their quote unquote value or beginners set uh, it's meant to imitate a sable brush, but my guess is that 
it is good enough for base coating it probably good enough for layer coating but even if you treat it well it's not going to last quite as long as your fifteen dollar brush that'll be all the gray and we will do the zandri dust next i believe So we'll do the Zandri dust on the skeletons, the various skulls. Then we'll do the Rackarth flesh on the candles. And I noticed that one of these graves has a little vine coming up the side, so we'll do some green on that. That will be our base coat, and then we'll come back for step number two. All right, so we have base coated spirit hosts. So the next step, we are complete with step number one, which is the base coating. So now we're going to step two, which is the washing. This is where the magic starts to happen. So we're going to use three washes here. They're going to be a green wash, or specifically Beal Tan Green. We're going to use a brown wash, specifically Agrax Earthshade. And then we're going to use a black wash, which is Non Oil. A wash is a or as Citadel calls them, a shade now. Uh, what this is is essentially thinned down paint. It is so thin that it's runny. What that means is, is that it's going to, I'm going to apply it over the entire miniature and it's going to run into the deepest areas of the miniature and give you some shading for free. So we'll do the ghosts first. We're going to cover the entire ghost miniature with green uh, to give it the glowy effect. So I'm going to use my 20 year old brush. Uh, again, I wish I could remember what material this is because it's, it's perfect for washing. Citadel has shade brushes, uh, which I'm sure are actually the same material, but Citadel brushes are expensive. This one is 20 years old, so it's free. So we're going to wet the bristle again a little bit. We're going to dunk it right in there. And at this point you want, or at least at this point I want, to soak the brush in it. This is the exception to brush care, I guess. I'm still trying, I, I still don't want it in the ferrule, but it's so thin, I'm not too worried about it. Uh, drying so we're just going to wipe that off onto the miniature and I'm being careful here uh, most of the time you want to wash with the brush in the opposite direction the light is coming from just to add more realistic shadows so I'm my brush is only touching the miniature in an up direction uh, I could make the case with spirit hosts that they create their own light but whatever, I'm still just going to wash up. And I'm not letting the wash pool too much. You can continue to move it around as much as you like. But what you'll see is that it's pooling in the recesses and creating a darker version than what you see in the peaks. And like I said, it automatically just immediately looks better it's shading job done so we're just going to go and wash the entire spirit hosts miniatures with the green one after the other and then we'll hit the other colors the same way i'm going to wash the base the dirt of the base and their silver weapons with the null oil or the black wash and then i'm going to get the bone and the grave and probably the candle too with the, with the brown wash. So a couple things to keep in mind when washing. Uh, if you have a large surface that you want to wash, you want to do the whole thing in one go. If you leave, uh, wash is so watery that will leave watermarks that are almost impossible to get rid of. Uh, so make sure you go all the way to the edges you can put the project down at any point you need, but 
So, so just make sure you finish one area completely before you move away and do something else. Uh, shading also, because it is so watery, takes a lot longer to dry. I would give it about half an hour. Usually what I do is when I'm done with the wash, that's my stopping point for the night, and I leave it overnight. So here we have the spirit hosts all washed. You can see like the, the skeleton on the bottom there is much more defined now. He's got almost black in all the recesses, and the ghosts also look more defined. This is a sloppy wash, not to being too direct with it, but step two is done. And now we go on to step three, which is layering. So what we're going to do is the washes have darkened everything a little bit and we're going to bring that back up with a layer paint. A layer paint is thinner than a base paint and so it's more translucent means some of the other paint will show through and for that we're just going to use a bit of a smaller brush and go over the model in the raised areas that aren't the deepest recesses. We'll try that for their weapons. So for these weapons we're going to switch to a brighter silver color. That's going to be... So we used steel before and now I want dark aluminum. So I'm going to pull out my Windsor Newton number one. The layering is when you can begin using your good brushes. And by good it just means that well taken care of the brushes should be as good as new for a very long time. So the get a little bit on the brush. And then what I'm going to do is going to just look at the places that I want brighter, but not necessarily the whole thing. So I'm just going to run a line at the top of their weapon there. Just to add a bit more contrast and make it snap. pop as it were. And I'm going to leave the rest the darkened bit. Actually that looks more like a point than anything else. So I'm going to I'm just going to put it on that whole top side, make that look a little bit better. So same over here. I'm just going to take the one side, the one, the side that's more towards the light and just brighten that up. And all this is doing is creating more of a contrast to make it more visually interesting and more readily apparent from this far away where you're going to be seeing it most often. That's the thing about miniature painting is that you have to you have to realize that you're going to be seeing these from a distance most often, so you really have to push contrast in order to get the each piece to look distinguishable from the rest. And we're still going to assembly line it. We're going to do the same steps on all three ghosts. This is where you start to need to be neat. Uh, and this is where you can really, you can use this step to clean up previous steps mistakes. Now I want you to notice something here if you can see it. Can you see it here? Okay, here. The brush is beginning to split there. I don't like that. That could be because some paint has been dried up in there and I didn't notice it. Um, the way to fix that is you can just rinse it off and get more paint on there again. So we're going to rinse the brush, we're going to reshape the tip, and we're going to try again. But if a brush starts to do that, you're going to notice that it does it in the same spot all the time. It creates kind of a memory. 
you might consider at that point doing some brush cleaning and some maintenance. Now, proper brush care is every time you're done with a session, you really should be cleaning your good brushes at least, if not all your brushes. We can go over that when we're done here. Okay, that's that layer done. Now this is where you could go and just rebuild up a lot of these layers, like for instance with this grave site here. Uh, I can go in and put some layer paint over these, uh, leaving the darkest areas dark. Like for, we're just going to make a line there. But there's a faster and easier way to do this, and that's called dry brushing. When you store your brushes, store your brushes tip up uh, and don't ever leave them in the water. That's the quickest way to get a bent tip. Okay, for dry brushing, the reason it's called that is because you're going to get just a little bit of mostly dried paint on the brush, which is generally not the best idea, but for this one it is, and then you rub it lightly across a textured surface and the very little bit of paint left will only hit the top of the surface creating a highlight in almost the same manner in reverse as the shade did the shadows. So I'm going to start on the bottom. I'm going to take a lighter color brown than the base. I'm going to put that on our palette. And so we're going to use a Citadel dry brush. Uh, for this, I'd probably prefer a little bit bigger of a brush, but this is the only size Citadel dry brush I have. The reason I like the Citadel dry brushes is that the bristles are stiff enough where they're not going to give, they're not going to get into the recesses, uh, but it's still pliant enough. Uh, it's, it's like the perfect texture. For instance, I tried uh, artist's camel hair brushes, which are for oil paint, so they're very stiff. It's too stiff. It would just, it would, it almost scrape the paint right off the, uh, it would scrape the paint right off the model. So what we're going to do here is, we're going to load the brush. We're going to get as much paint, well, we're going to get some paint up to about halfway up the brushes, and then we're going to wipe it all off. So you take your paper towel and you keep wiping until there's barely any paint coming off the brush onto the paper towel. And then you apply that to the miniature. Light strokes here. And the paint will start to come off onto the model in the raised areas and get you into some nice contrast. I'm not sure that you can see that as well as I can. So we'll come back when I've completed all the bases. Uh, I'm probably going to do two or three uh, once overs with this slightly lighter brown and then we'll come back. So here is the completed dry brush um, and you can see that the lighter areas look lighter exactly as we want. Uh, and you can push this even further by adding a third and final dry brush. So I'm going to take an even lighter tan and put it on top of that very lightly to get the biggest peaks. And so we're going to use a Baylor Bane Blade Brown. It's a very pale tan, desaturated. We're going to do the same thing. Just make sure it's wiped off the brush. And then very lightly get the highest points here and just make that contrast even more apparent. And that'll probably be it for the base. I'll do that to the other bases, then I'll dry brush the skulls and the grave sites, candles, and we'll come back for the ghosts. Some technique pointers when you're dry brushing, just like I recommended when you were doing the shadows, when you're doing the wash, 
you brush away or towards the light. With the dry brush, we're going to brush away from the light because this is the highlight. So we're going to take our dry brush and I'm only applying pressure in a downward direction. And this is just re-emphasizing what we did earlier with the wash. So these ghosts are the light source, so we're just going to dry brush away from the ghosts to create highlights on the skeleton as such. Now the one thing about dry brushing, dry brushing versus layering. Dry brushing is quick, it's super easy, but it tends to create kind of a, a chalky um, look, a dirty look. So if you want a model to look clean rather than dirty or quick, then I recommend using layering rather than dry brushing. All right, I'm going to attempt to go a little bit of an extra mile here on these ones. And I'm realizing that the ghost's glowing green so if something's glowing, it will cast light on other things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little bit of this pale green and I'm going to dry brush it onto the skeleton and see if we can't make it appear that the ghosts really are in fact glowing. We're going to put some on the grave as well. And once the model's done, we'll see how that looks. I might go over that with a bit of white. Uh, we'll see. And for the final touch, we will dry brush the ghosts themselves using an almost white of the cool color variety. And we're just going to go and push the contrast on the ghosts. Same way we did everything else, we're just going to dry brush it because it's quick and easy. Dry brushing also has the added benefit, if you're okay with the dirty chalky look, of feathering it so it makes an okay transition. And again, these are creating their own light, so I'm not particularly worried about which direction I'm brushing in. The point is, this is really only getting the raised areas, and so all the work we did with the wash is just adding to this effect. We're not overriding anything. We're just brightening up the main body and adding highlights at the same time. All right, so here we have completed spirit hosts. This has, the dry brushing is essentially combining Steps three and four. Step three is layering, building up your highlights. Step four is the final step, and that's the super small highlights. Um, what you'll see a lot of people refer to is called edge highlighting. The reason that we consider doing that is because, again, when you're looking at a model from down here, it's very hard to pick out the difference between some of the panels. So when we have the model up here close to us, what we can do is run a fine line of a super high value, super high, uh, is it a value? A super high value, close to white. Uh, and we run it along just the edges of the panels. And that again, increases the contrast to be visible at great distances or small scale. Uh, I generally am not a huge fan of edge highlighting because so if you have for instance uh, an entire model and you make a line around say this entire section here that makes the model look flat because in real life the highest highlights are only going to be facing the light they're not going to be away from the light so if you have this entire model, quote unquote, edge highlighted, it, it looks good technique wise, but when you bring the model to a medium vision, it just, it tends to make everything look flat. 
So what you can do is compromise and put edge highlights on the tops or the portions of the surface that's hitting the light. So I'm going to take out a number zero brush and I'm going to use the same white we highlighted or dry brushed the ghost with. And what I can do is I'll just run it across the tops of these candles here and a little bit of a line to highlight that lip of the candle. We can put it on top of this guy's shoulder bit, on his jaw, his cheekbones. This is essentially just going over what we did with the dry brush. Uh, and making it contrast even more. So I'll make a bright line across here and here. Again, just pushing that contrast for visual distinction. And for this you want uh, a pretty thinned paint. Not quite half and half water, but it's got to flow really good so that you can get a nice solid line. If there's a sharp edge, then you can actually just use the side of the brush like this. And that'll pick up just the edge, just the way a dry brush does, except it lays down a thicker line. And that's the final step on painting a miniature, is getting these last tiny highlights on. It's not a necessary step, but I just wanted to walk you through it, because you'll see it referenced a lot. This is technically edge highlighting, but in my mind, done correctly, and only hitting the edges that the light would hit, so that you create, you continue to maintain depth. This is a model that's in 3D. I don't know why you'd want to bring it back down to two dimensions. Once we got them all edge highlighted, this model is essentially done. The last step I do is repaint the edge of these bases. I generally go with a black rim. That's personal decision. I know in Games Workshop uh, pictures and heavy metal, they use a color that's called olive drab or steel, no, they call it steel legion, something like that. Um, so it's like a pale olive green, uh, but I like black because this is the miniature that you want to see. This lip just raises a little bit and makes it so that, you know, you're not moving around a piece of paper. So I color that black as stage decoration as you're not supposed to pay attention to it. Black is the color that you're going to actually use quite a lot of. So I recommend just getting dropper bottles. It's the same stuff. It's cheaper. Uh, and in fact, you could go whole hog and grab yourself a big bottle of actual artist's acrylic paint. This whole thing is probably 10 to 15 times as much as that's in this bottle. But the problem is that it's a very heavy acrylic and it doesn't, it doesn't flow as well. Uh, it's meant for big giant canvases, not these little tiny canvases. So you can use it, and it's a, it's, it's a cost-effective way to go, but I think the, uh, the dropper bottles are good enough. We're going to get a little bit on the palette, and we're going to take a large-ish brush. Let's go with... This one's fine. This is a number five. And I'm going to put... I'm going to thin this down more than usual, just because I really want it to flow. So we're mixing water in with the paint on the palette. And then we're just going to blacken out the edges. And once this is dry, uh, the next, this is essentially tabletop ready. What I like to do is put a coat of spray varnish on it just to make sure that the paint stays where it is because it's going to get handled, it's going to get jostled around. You don't want the paint chipping off and creating uh, white bits underneath. 
So you spray it down with a matte spray. Again, that's personal preference. Um, I don't recommend gloss spray, but matte or satin, they're slightly different finishes. But either way, spray varnish is the way to go. There's no reason to use anything other than Rust-Oleum or Krylon. And so here we have it, the three completed spirit hosts from box to tabletop. I went ahead and added some static grass to their bases for added effect. Um, maybe I'll do a video on how to do that. It'd certainly be on the scope of this video and nothing I recommend to do as a beginner. But you can see how relatively easy this process was. I would budget about 20 hours per, per box of models. I will put some links in the description below so that you can get more painting tutorials. I'll put a link to the Warhammer TV live channel. I recommend, if not subscribing, then at least checking them regularly for new paint videos. They have uh, about two minute paint videos on spe very specific colors or techniques and they are very good. They also have lots of videos on the complete painting process and other hobby related stuff. There's also Vince Venturella who is a very prolific YouTuber with lots of techniques for the advanced painter. So I hope you enjoyed that. Give us a like and subscribe and more hobby videos to come as well as battle reports.